Hello, my fellow Ripplers. This is Chris Miles, your cash flow expert and anti financial advisor. Welcome to our show that's for you and about you, those of you that work so hard for your money and you want your money to start working harder for you now. You want that freedom, cash flow, and prosperity today, not 30 or 40 years from now, but right now to live that life that you love with those you do love doing what you love. But most importantly, guys, it's about living a life of impact and meaning because as you're blessed financially, you can create a greater impact in the world. And guys, I'm so proud that I'm able to be here with you guys. I, I, I cannot tell you how much I appreciate you guys binging and sharing. And man, I just love seeing the numbers grow every time that we see this show. So thank you so much for being amazing, but not just tuning in, but also applying this stuff in your lives. Hey, as a reminder, you know, any of you guys are saying, hey, man, how do I hit that financial independence number by the year 2030? Go ahead and reach out to us. Go to our website, moneyripples.com. You can check out our ebook there, and you can also reach out to us directly to check it out. Chris Miles was able to retire twice by the time he was 39 years old, but he's not content to just enjoy his own financial freedom and peace of mind. Chris wants you to have your own ripple effect so you can live free today. He's not the financial advisor you expected. He's the anti-financial advisor you deserve. He's jumping behind the mic right now, ready to make waves. Here's Chris Miles. Okay, today, guys, I've got a repeat guest on here, uh, Scott Myers. Now, Scott is like the man when it comes to self-storage investing. And I know we've we've had a lot of different guests. They talk about, of course, apartment deals, right? Or, or single family houses or, or multifamily or whatever it might be, right? Uh, real estate's obviously the name of the game, but... When it comes to self-storage investing, it's a very unique niche. And, and that's something I want to bring Scott back on again, because, you know, the, the environment keeps changing. Things are freaking hot right now uh, in the real estate market. And, and what's often overlooked, because when things get hot, is that lots of people overlook certain aspects like self-storage investing. So, Scott, welcome back to our show. Hey, Chris. Good to see you again. Glad to be here. Yeah, same here, man. So for those of guests that maybe didn't listen to your show last year, tell mm -hmm. us a little bit about yourself and your background. Sure. So got involved in self-storage by way of, uh, well, I think the way that most people get into real estate is by way of single family houses. And then we uh, graduated to doing a multifamily after that. So we had about 75 single family houses, a little over 420 multifamily apartment units. And uh, you know, really didn't like, uh, still don't like the tenant toilet and trash uh, business. And um mm -hmm. And again, not to poo-poo that asset class uh, or those asset classes. I know um, many folks that are doing very, very well and making uh, lots of money in single family rentals, uh, flip and, you know, all sorts of strategies. Same with multifamily. But for us, we never, it seemed like we weren't able to get to that tipping point, you know, the economies of scale and, and having, uh, we had built a management team and we used management companies. But at the end of the day, I just uh, was growing tired of the challenges that are brought forth by that form of real estate. Well, if um, without, you know, pulling my hair out or getting out of the business altogether, then, you know, the only route left to stay in real estate without tenants, floats and trash is parking lots or self-storage. And so mm -hmm. you can't build a lot of value in, in parking lots. And so I began looking at uh, self-storage and yeah, my eyes were um, opened wide uh, to learn that when somebody doesn't pay you in self-storage, there's a lien law that every state has. It states that um, you can overlock them in a certain amount of time, usually by the sixth of the month. And if uh, they don't pay, you get to auction their stuff off and you get to um, keep the money to apply against their back rent and late fees. And then uh, when they move out, um, if they move out on their own or if uh, we do have to hold an auction, which we don't have to do very often, by the way, anyways, you know, we take a blower and we blow it out. Um, and in 30 seconds, that unit is ready versus having to paint and uh, carpet, you know, repair, clean, replace, um, you know, go without a, a month's uh, worth of uh, rent or six weeks to get the right person in there. Um, the unit is done in 30 seconds, and then we move in the next person waiting in line, and we don't do extensive background checks. It's because it's a metal box on a concrete slab where they're storing their stuff. Nobody's living there. So right. as long as they pay, they get to stay. So the, all those uh, factors combined and many, many more uh, made me uh, make the jump, uh, the switch over to self-storage. So we started in real estate in 93. Uh, up to 2005 was all single family and apartments. And then in 2005 is when we bought our first self-storage facility. And then for the next uh, two years, uh, then we begin uh, divesting and selling off all our houses and apartments. And that's where we find ourselves now is uh, in nothing but self-storage. So we've, uh, we have over 2.4 million square feet of self-storage across the country, over 14,000 units. And we syndicate just about uh, all of our projects now. So we bring on uh, limited partners into our projects um, for three to five years, typically, depending upon the project. 
and then they get a share of the uh, cash flow and the depreciation and then, of course the profits upon the sale so that's the model and um, times are good the pandemic and and recessions are good to self-storage not good to our country or people or individuals or the world but the self-storage industry has uh, benefited uh, quite quite a bit in the events of last year and uh, and again as we head into the next recession yeah, that's what I was going to ask you because because obviously the Great Recession was was an easy one because people were having to downsize like crazy and, mm -hmm. and they were using storage units to really save money on on costs, mm -hmm. right? They had to store mm -hmm. their stuff somewhere. Yeah, what's been different about this time around? Because it feels like it's been a little <clears throat> bit different. It hasn't been the same thing. People aren't being evicted, so to speak, but are people still mm -hmm. using self storage units? And if they are, what for? Yeah, so you know, during uh, the pandemic, uh, again, we, we saw a couple of perfect storms for self-storage. And that is, uh, mm -hmm. first of all, the colleges, uh, you know, they all shut down almost at the exact same time. And so all that stuff went into storage immediately instead of even disseminating and determining what comes home and what stays in that town or near the school, it all just got to put into storage. Then many businesses also were shut down you know, with the total lockdown and many of these small businesses, they just, they completely shut the doors. They, could, they couldn't withstand having no customers come in at all. They didn't have a web presence. Right. And so they were you know, moving out and breaking their leases or just you know, de defaulting on their leases um, or on their mm -hmm. buildings and space that they owned. And then their inventory and furnishings and everything else that was in that office or in that manufacturing space that went into storage until times turned around again or until they sold that stuff off. Well, then everybody was sent home from the office environment as well. And so they came home to uh, work and to do school. And so we had to set up makeshift classrooms and offices in the home. And so folks had to clean out the bedroom, clean out the kitchen, the formal living room, um, you know, making space for anywhere and everywhere that we can uh, conduct school and business, uh, sometimes also for two wage earners. So all that extra furniture that was moved out of the house went into storage as well. Subsequently, we had very low interest rates and there are sectors of the economy and people doing very well. And so, you know, the housing uh, market has been crazy. And so when people move, uh, they when people get ready to sell their house, they stage it and they put all their stuff into storage to make it look like there's more room. And then when they eventually have that move on both ends, buyers and sellers utilize storage for a short term, sometimes a long time frames. And then as we head into the recession, as you mentioned um, now, and depending on who you talk to, we're either in it or we're about to go into it. Um, looking at uh, the bond market and all the other markers um, in, in the market, you know, businesses are downsizing still. Individuals are then having to downsize. Um, to your point, the moratoriums um, will be burning off uh, on evictions. We haven't seen a lot of that yet, like we did in 2008. Uh, but nevertheless, there's folks who just can't afford to live where they're living right now on their own. And so they're moving in with friends, uh, back with family. Right. And so, you know, their extra stuff goes in storage until, again, the economy turns back around again. So, you know, once again, we don't celebrate pandemics or recessions, but, you know, we've done uh, very well during uh, the pandemic and as well as we head into this next uh, cycle. We were never shut down. It is a in in a business that is essential we've had touchless contactless rentals since before it was cool to have touchless contactless rentals uh in our industry by way of being able to rent a unit with a cell phone um uh, just yeah. just as easy if not easier than a, than a red box rental and so we never missed a beat uh, during this entire time frame and it has uh, served us well oh, that's fantastic yeah that's an interesting perspective you brought up because it, it reminded me of y2k recession right when mm -hmm. those mm -hmm. times like it was it was the big businesses and companies especially the tech companies that were closing their businesses and having yeah. to move stuff out consignment mm -hmm. was a big thing back mm -hmm. then and i can see that being a, a big thing for self-storage too and mm -hmm. and even with the recent real estate market as hot as it's been even though it's been hard to find inventory you know and mm -hmm. i know with my wife's in my case we actually did rent a storage unit for a few mm -hmm. months just mm -hmm. to hold our stuff while it got staged, right? Yeah. Just to get mm -hmm. it out of the way. And now mm -hmm. we're realizing, hey, all this stuff in the storage we haven't yeah. had for the last few months. Mm -hmm. Do we want to keep it? Do we want to sell yeah. it off? You know, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it's kind of got us to the point of, hey, maybe we want to minimize. So it's it's almost been that, you know, mm -hmm. easy transition. Um, and yep. it's, it's it's been a very unique experience, I've noticed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we really fill a, a niche for, for so many reasons, uh, all of which we mentioned and which you did as well. And and I'll tell you, there's an anomaly out there, and I, I may be the only one um, talking about it, and maybe I'm off my rocker. Either way, um, I, I think now it's it, it's almost I hear I'm around people all day long that have a storage unit that are renting a storage unit and talking about it, and I obviously I pick up on it. But yeah. I, I have a feeling now, Chris, that this is almost a, an amenity, almost like um, 
you know, something that people have that is part of their identity. So they get to say, yeah, I got a storage unit. I put it in my storage unit. You know, it's mm-hmm. almost like it's just part of what they have, you know, because they've got so much stuff. They want their, their, their friends and whomever to hear and understand that they have so much stuff that they have their own storage unit. So it's almost kind of cool. You're in the cool crowd. If you've got a storage unit, it's almost like an accessory, if you will. And, yeah. uh, and again, I may be off, but the way that I hear people talking about it, they're kind of proud to have it and um, they like it. It's just part of their identity. Yeah. I haven't moved in for a few weeks. It was great. Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Please don't. <clears throat> no, definitely not the place to go. No. So, well, that's fantastic. So, and, and, and what do you see with the, the future of like even the values of these? Like, are you buying these? Because obviously there's other people in your space. So are you mm-hmm. finding it more competitive now? Or are you finding it less competitive? What's, what's mm-hmm. going on for yourself? Yeah, clearly more competitive. I mean, self storage has been on an incredible run um, for quite a number of years now. And so, um, you know, all eyeballs are on, on self storage, especially after last year. I mean, it always does well during, you know, inflationary periods when times are good, mm-hmm. people buy more stuff and they store more stuff. Um, you know, when we had the pandemic for all those reasons I mentioned, uh, you know, we had the hockey stick effect, you know, and continues storage does really well. But then during a, a recessionary period or like what we had in 2020, uh, the, the industry did very, very well. We filled up the facilities filled up. Uh, rates obviously then went up after that. And then we have this uh, shortage of building supplies. And so some of these development projects have been put on hold, stalled, killed altogether. And all that does then is uh, just uh, create uh, more upward pressure on uh, pricing. So upward pressure on pricing means uh, higher valuations. So the low hanging fruit, uh, not not really out there. And, and I would argue, Chris, I mean, you and I have had this conversation before, you know, if it's low hanging fruit, it probably is not a, really a deal. I mean, that's, mm-hmm. you're just buying a you're buying a self storage facility at retail cost at, at, at Macy's. You're you're maybe overpaying for it. Anybody can go out and do that. Um, truly, true deals are created, and so we're mm-hmm. still creating deals. We're still doing deals. You just create them, just like we had before. Um, but it, it, now we have to be a little more creative because it is a little more competitive. Um, there are a lot of people looking at our space because uh, the storage industry again has done very well. So. Uh, for us, we're, we're still, the same marketing techniques are, are in place. We're, we're calling folks, we're sending direct mails and, and following up uh, with a, a calling sequence and talking to the mom and pop sellers. We have relationships with an awful lot of folks in the markets and in which we serve uh, as well. But we also, we have the ability to transact and close. And so yeah. for the competition, the new folks that are coming in, you know, they can't confidently say that, um, that they can perform and do the things like, like a, a, a veteran company like ours and many others out there can. And so, you know, we're still, we're, we're still playing with most of the same players out there, even though there are some new entrants. But at the end of the uh, spectrum in which we're operating in, there hasn't been as, as many new players coming in to, um, to cause a ruckus on our end. That's great. And I've noticed, too, that you, you generally don't <laughs> just do building from the ground up type of construction for self-storage. You often will convert space, correct? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's our, that's probably our favorite piece of the entire investment portfolio. Uh, mm-hmm. We, we build from the ground up, we'll buy a piece of dirt and then we'll build new buildings on it. We acquire existing facilities, you know, only turnarounds. We're looking for only value add. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then in the middle of that is a conversion. So it's an old grocery store. It's an old industrial building. It's a warehouse uh, that has gone vacant, sometimes lumber yards. And the shell, the zoning is in place, first of all, on the dirt, which is, you know, that, that buys us sometimes 12 to 18 months alone if the zoning is already in place. And then if we've got buildings, a shell already created, then, you know, we're, we're three to four months from building it out. You know, when, once we get all the plans and everything in place, it takes a little longer than that. But once we uh, begin to uh, turn the shovel, so to speak, mm-hmm. we're three to four months out from uh, opening up our doors wow. when we have an existing facility. And so that entire project from front to back could be soon, maybe nine months or, or so. Of six to nine months, uh, six months on the minimum. Mm-hmm. Uh, when whereas if we started with a piece of dirt and we had to go through zoning and everything else, I mean we're yeah. we're eighteen months or longer to go through uh, permitting, entitlement, zoning, architectural review, and everything else. So, uh, yeah. if we can get that shelf for pennies on the dollar because it is vacant or dark, then that just uh, lowers our cost and the end product. Uh, we bring it to market faster and it's at a lower cost than if we were to build it from the ground up. So, that's a, that's a double whammy and uh, and again the reason why we like conversion so well. Uh, I love it. Mm-hmm. And so now I know that every deal is different. It's unique. Mm-hmm. You know, they all have their own things. Like you said, it's typically a three to four year hold, right? Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Some can, it could be a little bit sooner. It could be a little bit later, right? But that's mm-hmm. kind of the general range. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and you tend to see some pretty dang good returns. I mean, you, I know you mm-hmm. pay a preferred return often with your deals, but you mm-hmm. also have a growth aspect where mm-hmm. I've noticed like at 15 to 20% IRR is not too uncommon, oh. correct? Mm-hmm. Correct. Mm-hmm. 
Wow. So we've, um, you know, <laughs> again, my philosophy is that uh, we, we like to keep our folks happy. And that means our limited partners that we bring all, along with us. And there's a whole lot of things that make them happy. And, and that is um, a good solid track record, good communication along the way, uh, and then comes returns. Mm -hmm. But uh, if we don't get any attention from the returns that we offer, then they won't bother to look into the other two, which means um, our history and uh, us to know, like, and trust us. Mm -hmm. So the goal is to offer a little higher return than most of our competitors that are out there. And, mm -hmm. and when I say competitors, you know, we're, we're in the money business. We're yeah. a financial services company that invests in self-storage facilities. That's how we generate our returns. It's a little easier to do it in self-storage than the other asset classes. And so therefore it's a little more profitable. Mm -hmm. So therefore we can offer one, two, three percentage points higher in an internal rate of return than somebody who's doing say a, a multifamily or mobile home parks or some of the other asset classes. So we have to perform uh, beyond mm -hmm. that and which we do. Uh, but at the end of the day, it will still leave a little more on the table because we want to fill these up quickly because we want our, our pipeline to continue to flow and have uh, the money coming through for all of our projects. And we know if people invest with us once, they're usually going to invest over and over again. Right. Absolutely. Well, if somebody wanted to, to follow your stuff or even know what kind of offerings you have, what's the best thing they can do? I know most of your stuff is for accredited investors only, but there's a few mm -hmm. occasional mm -hmm. ones that may not be. Uh, if someone wanted to reach out and get that contact with you guys, what would they do? Mm -hmm. Sure. So uh, we do syndications, uh, which are single asset, single entity um, LLCs that we set up. And we do offer it, as you said, Chris, for accredited investors as well as uh, unaccredited investors. But to learn about our offerings, what we've done in the past and what we have uh, going on currently, go to PassiveStorageInvesting.com. That's PassiveStorageInvesting.com. And again, that'll show uh, the projects that we have in the works right now, projects that we've uh, closed on and that are in a lease up and others that we've performed on on the past and paid out as well, as well as some informational materials just to, if you're new to the self-storage industry or new to investing passively, a uh, ton of white papers and lots of videos to show you just exactly what it looks like whether you're investing with us or somebody else. Um, it's just a, a service that we offer. Awesome. I know it's a very exciting, very exciting times and uh, a very exciting asset class to look into. It's got a own unique niche and makes it fun, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Yes, it does. Yeah, it's crazy to think, but uh, you know, these are metal boxes on concrete slabs. How do you get excited about it? But um, you know, we <laughs> like the business. We understand it. It's a, it's a simple, predictable business model. Um, it's not an easy business. Mm -hmm. No business is, but you know, we can hit marks much easier here than we can in some of the other asset classes we we're investing in. And yeah, times are good right now, so we are uh, we're able to. Uh, pick and choose and prioritize which projects we take on, which is always a good position to be in. Yeah. And you definitely got a great track record for it too. So yeah, I really well, appreciate you, your time here, Scott. It. Yeah. You've been awesome. And, and again, everybody check out, you know, you said passive storage investing.com, correct? Correct. Mm -hmm. Yep. So passive storage investing.com. Check it out. We'll put it in the show notes. If you're driving, don't worry, don't die, <laughs> you know, <laughs> make sure you're doing the right thing here, but guys, definitely go check that out. That's something of interest to you. And, and again, you know, guys, it's not just about listening to this show. It's about doing something about it. It's about changing mm -hmm. your life. And that's what we try to do here each and every day. Thank you for allowing us to create a ripple effect through you. Again, Scott, thank you so much for your time. Everybody make a wonderful and prosperous week. We'll see you later. Hey! Visit us online at moneyripples.com for more resources to help you fix money leaks and get your money working harder for you now. Now.